Good afternoon. <laughs> Sounded a little muffled. Maybe that's because of the mask. Very nice to see all of you today. Welcome to those who are joining us uh, via Facebook Live as well. Uh, let me introduce our service a little bit today. Uh, we continue with that theme we began last week entitled Faithful Through the End. Uh, this week's focus will be on the last judgment, on Judgment Day. And as I mentioned last week, that can count, sound kind of frightful and fearful for us. Um, but as God's people who know the Savior by faith, uh, we know that this is a day we can look forward to with joy and confidence. And so God's blessings as you consider that truth with me uh, during our message today. I know that some of you have already filled out your green cards. Kudos for that, getting them in early. If you haven't yet, please take a moment to do that during our service today. There are boxes in the back that you can set those cards in along with the pens on your way out today. Uh, before we get started, why don't you take a moment to greet those who are worshiping nearby you today. And I invite you to please stand. We'll ask the Lord's blessing on our worship. We worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for our first song.
please be seated. We'll continue by making confession of our sins to God and to one another. God reminds us in his word that we are sinful even from the moment of conception and in need of his forgiveness. In mercy, God opened to us the throne of his grace through Jesus. Let us then with sincere and broken hearts draw near to God and in honest and true confession lay our sins before him. I invite you to please join with me. Father, I have sinned against you in many ways. I am unworthy of your love and your mercy. I believe your promise of life, forgiveness, and salvation through Jesus, and I ask you to cleanse me. Forgive me for all my sins, the sins that I can remember and the sins that I am not even aware of. This I ask in the name of Jesus, your Son, my Lord and Savior. The Lord assures us that not only does he hear our plea, but we have one who speaks in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. On the cross, he took on himself every one of our sins and paid the punishment that we deserve. It is by grace that we are saved through faith This is a gift from God. So in the name of Jesus Christ and at his command and by his promise, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this evening comes from the prophet Daniel chapter 7. Just two short verses, but it gives us this dramatic view of that judgment day scene as we see the ancient of days take his seat on the throne and open the books that are set before him. We know about the book of life, of course, the book that has the names of all of God's people written down in it. But scripture tells us also about the books that record all the things that the people of this world do. But by God's grace, we know that all the Evil, all the sin that we have committed that would be recorded in those books has been blotted out once and for all by Jesus' death in our place. And so we have confidence even in the face of a scene like this one. Please listen. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. This is the word of our God. Our second scripture lesson today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 2. In this section, the point that Paul wants to make is that if anybody would seek to stand before God on Judgment Day based on the things that they have done, then they had better come with absolute perfection and perfection that was offered all of the time in their lives from start to finish. If we want to be judged based on what we have done, that's the standard that God has set. And so as God's people, we rejoice that we're judged instead by what Jesus has done for us. Please listen. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, 
there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue our worship with our next song. Praise. 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus, dear friends. The portion of God's word that we'll give our attention to today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. It's what is sometimes called the parable of the sheep and the goats, but really it's Jesus' presentation of what we can expect come the last day. So please listen. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his, thro- on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. If you were to think of the very best days of your life, which ones would come to mind? Though many of us probably don't remember that day, the day of our baptism would have to be up there near the top of the list. Considering the many wonderful and eternal promises that God made to us on that day. But which other ones would come to mind? Maybe the day that you graduated from college, or the day that you got some big promotion at work. Maybe the day that you were engaged, or the day that you were married, maybe the day that your first child was born, or the days on which each of your children were born. Maybe it would be a special anniversary, 40, 50, even 60 years, and you have all of your friends and family together to celebrate. You know, as we think about what would maybe be the best days of our life. Maybe the younger ones among us today are thinking and kind of hoping, well, good, I got my best days still coming. And the older ones are maybe thinking, you know, perhaps my best days have already come and gone. But as God's people, whether young or old, the fact is our best day is still coming. Our focus today is on the last judgment. And maybe when you think about the best days of your life, judgment day doesn't immediately come to mind. But as Jesus describes what he has in store for his people on that day, then it becomes clear that all who have faith in him, all who are faithful to him, can look forward to that last day as their best day. Just listen to some of the promises and previews that Jesus gives us for that day. 
In Revelation chapter 2, he says, Be faithful even to the point of death. And on that day, I will give you the crown of life. Jesus tells his people what they can expect to hear from him on that day. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. And as we heard in the verses I just read, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For those who are faithful to the Lord, your best day is still coming. First of all, on that day, we know that we're going to see the glory of our Savior. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Jesus' first disciples long to see that vision of his glory, as do we. And you know, as Jesus was speaking these words here in Matthew 25, he knew that his death was near. For 33 years, he had humbled himself to carry out our salvation. And in just a little while, his first disciples would see Jesus in the depths of his humiliation as he was arrested and put on trial and beaten and crucified. And through it all, they would have to stand by him. Through it all, they would have to remain faithful to their Lord, to continue to trust his word despite what they were witnessing and seeing. In the same way, Jesus calls on us to remain faithful to him throughout our lives, to continue to trust in his word, even when his glory is not at all evident to us. But just like Jesus' first disciples, of course, we know that that glory is always there. And on the last day, the glory that remains hidden right now is going to be made clear. The same Jesus who those disciples saw crucified, the same Jesus who ascended into heaven before their very eyes is going to return in all of his blazing glory. Think for a minute about the scene that unfolded on the Mount of Transfiguration. When for a little while, Peter, James, and John caught a glimpse of Jesus' divine glory. We're told that it knocked him to the ground. Or think about the revelation to St. John. When he was exiled on the island of Patmos, he tells us this. He said, I saw someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Can you imagine that sight? And everybody's going to see it. All nations will be gathered before him on that day. Will it be frightening? Well, for some, those who rejected Jesus will see him revealed as exactly what he and his followers and his word always claimed that he was. Frightening for some. But for us who know him by faith, this day is one to look forward to with joy. We know that that glorious king is our brother who humbled himself to redeem us and who has now come to give us the kingdom. Jesus says when we see him appear in all his glory, we can lift up our heads with joy because we know that our salvation is at hand. For the faithful, when Jesus appears in his glory, we know that we have just arrived at our very best day. When he comes, we're told he's going to gather all the nations before him to stand in judgment. Again, is that a frightening thought? Well, certainly to some, right? I mean, those who have rejected him, 
They don't want to think of that idea of standing before him in judgment. And so many in our world simply ignore that or try to deny it in whatever way they can. And yet, the scriptures consistently promise it. Hebrews chapter 9 says, a man is destined to die once and then face the judgment. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Week after week in our worship, we confess our confidence in this truth that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And when that truth starts to sink in with us and hit home with us, well, the thought might be a little frightening to us too. We know how many offenses there are for which our Lord could rightly judge us and condemn us. We think of all those times that we disobeyed his commands to run after the things of this world because we thought that it would be better, better than what God wants. We think of those times when we neglected his word and sacrament and maybe for no better reason than this, than we wanted just a couple extra hours of sleep in the morning or maybe we wanted to get an earlier start on our plans for the day. And so we stayed away. We think about all of the times that it was so perfectly clear to us what God had in mind for us to do. The right things to walk in in our lives, the wrong things to stay away from. And yet we stubbornly did just the opposite. We know how many impure thoughts have been here. How many unkind words have left our lips. How many ungodly actions have been evident in our lives. I mean, the fact is, who can finally number all of those things? And yet the judge knows each and every one of them. And the verdict that we deserve because of those things is frightening. It's also clear. Prophet Isaiah says, your sins have separated you from your God. We heard earlier in our lesson from Romans, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. If separation and trouble and distress is what we were anticipating on the last day, then it could not be our best day. But thanks to Jesus, because of our trust in him for forgiveness, because we wear his righteousness rather than our own, he promises to give us just exactly the opposite of what we deserve. And it all begins with Jesus separating the nations on that day. Just like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. For a time they may have grazed together, but come evening when they're brought in, the shepherd pulls them apart. And it's work that he does very easily. That's how it's going to be on the last day when Jesus separates the nations. There are going to be no close calls. There's not going to be any waiting and wondering. There's certainly not going to be any recounts. The Lord knows those who are his. And so for us as God's people, it will be immediately obvious to us on that day that all of God's promises have been kept as he pulls us to his right side. And as he separates the unbelievers to his left, we'll know that the same Lord, who by his word assured us day in and day out of his love and grace as we walked in this world, that same Lord will assure us once again of those same things as he draws us close to his right side. As his people, we know what we get to expect on that day. And the basis for that separation that the Lord Jesus makes is on only one thing, and that's faith in him. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
But see, here's the thing that Jesus describes in this parable today. That faith which only God can see, on the last day, he's going to make that faith evident for everyone to see. As the Lord Jesus provides evidence to all the nations of his gracious verdict. For those on the right, there's not going to be a mention of any sin because they've been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. Through faith in Jesus, God has declared us holy in his sight. And so there will be nothing negative for him to say about us. Instead, the Lord Jesus on that day is going to point to those works of love that were prompted by faith and performed by his people. On that day, the Lord Jesus is going to point out your faithfulness and my faithfulness. And notice the things that he mentions because they're not big things in the eyes of the world. Food and drink, clothing and shelter, a visit during a difficult time, simple acts of mercy. And yet Jesus says they are so valuable to him. And he explains why that is. He says, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And maybe we kind of wonder, can that really be true, Jesus? These simple acts of love, can they be so precious in your sight? And his answer is yes. His answer is well done, good and faithful servant. For those standing on the left, there will also be evidence presented. Jesus tells us that he will say to them, I was hungry and thirsty. I was a stranger. I needed clothes. I was sick and in prison. And you didn't do anything to help me. And even on that great and glorious day, the unbelievers will continue in their rebellion against him. They will challenge the evidence that Jesus presents on that day. Lord, when did we see you and not help you? But remember what we heard in the lesson from Romans. God's judgment is based on truth. And so his verdict that day is going to stand. Jesus will say, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. The letter to the Hebrews tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so for all those who reject Jesus as their Savior, there can be not one single piece of positive evidence to present in their favor on that day. Jesus says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Just as surely as we as God's people believe in eternal life in heaven because Jesus has promised it, so also we must believe that there is an eternal punishment in hell because Jesus has promised that too. To those who reject him, Jesus will say, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's hell. That's the eternal separation from our gracious God and Savior. But you see, what's clear from Jesus' words there is that God doesn't desire that anybody should meet that fate. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for mankind. For mankind, God prepared the plan of salvation. He carried it out by sending his son and made sure that it was proclaimed to all so that all might be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what God wants for mankind. But for those who reject what God has graciously prepared for them and offered to them, well, they show their allegiance to Satan, God's archenemy. And so Jesus says, then they will share in his fate. And that fate couldn't be made any more clear. Jesus says they will go away to eternal punishment. 
But whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. To the faith-filled and to the faith-full, Jesus promises this invitation. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take the inheritance prepared for you. No, you didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. But God has blessed you with this inheritance nonetheless. It's the kingdom that he prepared since the creation of the world, and it is now yours to enjoy for all eternity. Before you were ever born, in eternity, God chose you to be his very own. He called you to faith in his Son and justified you by his blood. Throughout your days on earth, by his word and by his spirit, he preserved you in faith. And he'll do so right up to the point of death. And to such people he promises that what's waiting is glory. Be faithful to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. To the faithful, we know what's coming on that day. To all of us who are maybe sitting here this evening thinking our best days have already come and gone, well, think again. For those who are faithful to the Lord, the last day will definitely be your best day. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to please stand. We'll join in confessing our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. This is the time when we would generally collect up our offering. As you know, we have a box set out in the back that you can place a paper offering in, or you can sign up for our online giving if you like through our website at bethanyappleton.org. So we will continue our service then with our prayers. I invite you to join your hearts with mine. Heavenly Father, we confess with sorrow that we have sinned and deserve only your anger and punishment. If you kept a record of our sins, we would surely be lost. We confess with joy that your unfailing love has redeemed us. Our hope is in you and in your full redemption. Around us, we see the signs of the last days, war, famine, earthquakes, false prophets, spiritual apathy. Use these signs to remind us that we do not know the day or hour when Christ will come. Keep us faithful to your word. Send your spirit to strengthen our faith so that we are always prepared for your son's return. Make us faithful in sharing your word and cause many more to put their hope in you before the end comes. Build our fellowship of love as brothers and sisters in faith. Help us support one another when trials and troubles come our way. Heavenly Father, we eagerly wait for Jesus to come again and make all things new. May he find us whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, faithfully enduring to the end through the power of your Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Dear Father in heaven, we give you thanks today also on behalf of our military veterans. Through them, you have provided us with blessings that people around the world envy. But the presence of our veterans reminds us of your warning that wars and rumors of wars will continue until the end. In your mercy, keep war from our shores. Frustrate the plans of all those who would cause us terror. Lord of the nations, we ask 
that you would continue to bless our country with men and women who are willing to go to distant and dangerous places to protect us from those who would do us harm. Be with our veterans as they continue their march through life. Protect them. Give them the health and strength they need. Be their shield and strength, their guide and their guard. Give to them the peace that surpasses all understanding as they place their trust in Jesus and long for the home that he fought for and won for them. Dear Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. We join together in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll join in our next worship song.
receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.